improving the accuracy of facial recognition software for everyone. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet, and joining me is Stephanie Kim. She is a developer advocate and software engineer at Algorithmia. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. So what does Algorithmia do? And talk about your role there. Sure. So Algorithmia is a platform that specializes in, um, in the DevOps for data science. So we try to take away um, that friction point uh, for data scientists to deploy their models and scale them. And uh, so in a few minutes, data science can take their pre-trained models, deploy it on our platform in several languages, such as Python and R. And then we also have an enterprise version. Um, so people can uh, take that same system, deploy it on their stack, um, even if they need to, it behind a firewall, et cetera. And again, they really, we really focus on being the DevOps for data science. There's been a huge amount of progress in facial recognition, but we still have a long way to go. You've spoken on facial recognition bias and I guess, what exactly is that? What is facial recognition bias? So, well, facial recognition um, is, is used in so many applications right now. And like any machine learning model, um, especially supervised uh, machine learning models, you really have to focus on the data that the model's trained on. And when it's trained on a non-diverse data set, we can create models that are biased, uh, only working for, that only have high accuracy for certain groups of people. And so we wanna make sure we build robust models that generalize um, to all people, not just the um, people that, not just the faces that the model is trained on. Talk about the open face model. How are models trained and how might bias be introduced in the training and testing sets? Sure, so well, all facial recognition models, um, first of all, they have to detect a face in an image. Um, that face is separated from the background of the image. And then the image is normalized, uh, normalized so it becomes grayscaled and the position of the face needs to um, all be looking the same direction. And then that gets thrown into a neural net for feature discovery. And when it's ready for classification, it's used to uh, compare a, um, a, an image of a face to another image in a face. And so open face isn't any different in that sense. Um, it does all that. The, the reason it stands out, and it was developed by Carnegie Mellon um, researchers there, the reason it stands out is it was developed to be trained on um, a small data set and have higher accuracy. And so it's really good for mobile uh, applications. So that's where that really stands out. Um, but other than that, it follows the same uh, structure as any facial recognition model. So you need a, um, to detect the face and it uses what's called DLib for that and you need to um, train your model and then you um, open face uses labeled faces in the wild uh, which is a fairly old data set to uh, determine the accuracy of their model and then um, it gives the accuracy and then you can use that facial uh, recognition model that was pre-trained um, by the folks at Carnegie Mellon you can use that and train your images um, and again, fairly high accuracy on um, about 10 images minimum. And it, again, it has fairly high accuracy because it was developed for a mobile application. So it needs to be really lightweight and quick. But wouldn't a small data set be ripe for bias? So yes, in, in the sense of, um, in the sense when you're training on say 10 images, in a mobile application, you're going to be looking at, um, uh, for instance, in, in a retail setting, if you were to use this application um, and you wanted to capture customers' faces and match them you know, um, to your database, uh, it wouldn't matter so much. So, so that's this application of it, no. So, you're, you're, 
yeah, it's, it's the 10, the, the 10 images, the small images, um, is for a specific application. It's meant to be fast. So what you're referring to would be the training set that Carnegie Mellon um, trained the model on. So yes, that, that is a lot bigger. That needs to be diverse because that's showing a generic representation of the face, of any face. So a generic representation of the face needs to in, be very diverse, right? So, so let's talk about use cases then. Um, facial recognition is being used in surveillance and law enforcement. How do we find bias in those applications? So yeah, there's a, there's a big issue with that because there, um, the facial recognition software that's used uh, by in police applications, uh, it's not regulated. And so uh, we have no insight on how, how the models are being used um, the, or their accuracy. So that's a big gap. Um, some of them um, don't even need to be audited internally. So again, we don't have any insight to that, but an FBI co-authored study with perpetuallineup.org um, did find that um, facial recognition models in general performed uh, more poorly on African Americans. They had lower accuracy levels than Caucasians. Are there formal or structured tests that can re reveal or measure bias in models? So there's a few different ways that people are looking at this. Um, so an MIT researcher, Joy uh, Bulamini, has done a ton of research around this, and she's created, um, along with uh, Timming Gabru from Microsoft Research, um, they created the Pilot Parliament's Benchmark, where they used a uh, skin type to, um, to find, um, to create basically a more diverse data set. And they took pictures um, from Parliament and they took from the range of the darkest skin types um, and then they took the range from the lightest skin types. So they really wanted to focus on skin type range um, to encompass everybody, not just um, uh, what you might find in other data sets. Also, there has been research done, um, and there's this, uh, there's what's called Fitz Fitzpatrick skin type classifier, and that could be used to actually uh, label different images at, as different skin types. And a lot of these data sets that are being used have um, been shown to be, I think, around 70% Caucasian. Um, and mostly male as well. So there are a couple ways to test it out. Um, and so I highly recommend anyone doing uh, facial recognition use, to use the pilot parliament's benchmark. You do have to request it. Um, also, IBM um, recently just put out uh, two diverse data sets that are available for training. And uh, they claim that they're the largest public data sets available. And I, I think one of them is from um, geotags from Flickr images. And so that'll be a, a great, those are both great tools to be able to um, improve diversity and um, create more robust models that don't overfit to the data. So why should we care about bias in the model? I mean, what are the implications? What happens when bias is present? Right, so um, there are, you know, a lot of, when we think of facial act, um, recognition models we think of unlocking our phones or our computers and we're just like okay well big deal if it doesn't work on everybody but you know I've, I've talked to people um, uh, that they can't even unlock their computer they're african-american and they can't even get their computer to unlock with facial recognition and again people are like okay well you know that sucks and we should do better but that's not a huge deal but when you look at at it in the context of surveillance and uh, police applications being used and the facial recognition models um, being trained on homogenous data sets, possibly then failing, according to the FBI co-authored study, failing more often on African Americans. This could, you know, put people at risk for being misidentified, um, especially because, say, in Florida, they not only have access to mugshots in their database, they have access to DMV images. And so those are non-offending citizens that could be misidentified. Um, 
and that's that's a huge more you know larger societal problem and then of course it's an individual impact too on those people who get misidentified so how are we trying to solve bias and facial recognition so as i mentioned a lot of people um as we raise awareness a lot of people are really finding ways to increase diversity in training sets and as I said, the pilot parliaments benchmark is a great benchmark data set to test the accuracy of your model. If you don't have access to diverse training sets, um, then at least you have a test data set to test your model. If it's failing on a more diverse test set, then it's time to go back and, you know, go to the drawing board and um, and, and there, people have talked about using augmented data sets. So if they don't have diverse data sets, they can kind of fake them. And that's an option too. But now that IBM has um, put out the public diverse data sets, I think that's a, a great option. People are, um, uh, from researchers to, you know, private companies that don't have access to huge data sets uh, like Facebook and Google do, um, now have a data set that they can refer to and use for their training, training their models. Well, Stephanie, I really appreciate your time and shedding some light on one of the issues with facial recognition and facial recognition bias is something we definitely need to pay attention to. If somebody wants to find out more of your, about your research or connect with you personally, how can they do that? Um, yeah, you can find me. Um, uh, really, the best way is to email me at Stephanie at algorithmia. Dot com. So go ahead and email me with questions. I love to answer them. I've given this talk um, on open face particularly, but um, focusing on facial recognition and racial bias in facial recognition. Um, and I, I love to give the talk and shed awareness and get feedback from people. I'm always getting um, personal anecdotes that really make it hit home. So I love talking to people about it and raising awareness. So. Well, thanks again. I'm glad you're doing that work. Um, if you guys want to connect with me or if you want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic, or maybe connect with me on social media. You can go to my website, which is tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites, including Twitter, which I'd love to hear from you. If you connect with me on Twitter, let's chat. Thanks for listening.